Hello, my name is Dr. Lloyd Hay, and I'm a scoliosis surgeon here in Raleigh uh, and work alongside you here at Wake Med Children's Hospital. And I just did an in-service uh, for the pediatric nurses here at Wake Med this past week, and Wanda just asked me to make a, a video of this to help train uh, new nurses coming on the floor to orient them about uh, how we take care of scoliosis patients here at Wake Med. I've been blessed to work with you guys for the last 11 years. Uh, here, as well as I also work out of Duke Raleigh Hospital after also then serving for 10 years uh, back at Big Duke um, before starting up the Hay Clinic back in uh, 2005. So my own story goes back to being a pediatric patient myself back in 1978. I was hit by a car and could easily have been killed, um, but a wonderful doctor named Mark Pittman orthopedic surgeon was willing to take on my very rough case where I had a very bad open tibia fracture and he basically helped put my my leg and my life back together. But he was part of a team that also included nurses, physical therapists and others that really then inspired me to combine engineering with compassion uh, to help serve other patients. So for the last 21 or more years I've taken care of kids and adults with scoliosis after being blessed with excellent mentorship and training at Boston Children's under Dr. John Hall and John Emmons and others uh, for my chief residency fellowship and residency training. I also received adult training at Duke, uh, neurosurgery orthopedic training, where I also served on faculty for 10 years. So my own uh, journey as a pediatric patient goes back to 1978, as I said, uh, where uh, basically my life was turned upside down and also faced the potential for an amputation. But Dr. Pittman, who wasn't even on call, uh, was willing to take on my case and do a careful physical exam and then do a series of surgeries with bone grafts and debridements uh, over several months in the hospital to help put, put me back together again. Uh, there's a wonderful physical therapist named Barbara Bader who helped with wound care and to eventually teach me how to walk again and also wonderful pediatric nurses. Um, I think the, the key thing uh, in terms of developing my own understanding about the pediatric and adult patient was my own three months stay in the hospital. And I just remember my football co coach crying uh, the first week I was in the hospital knowing that I'd never play football again. Uh, 11 surgeries, two iliac crest bone grafts, taking my exams in the hospital, two bouts of sepsis, always facing the risk of amputation, lots of painful uh, dressing treatments and Hubbard tank treatments, uh, trying to just count backwards to not think about it. Uh, and even people being kind enough to bring me a harmonica that I could actually play in the Hubbard tank to help keep my mind off of the painful treatments. Uh, Dr. Pittman was great, but he also had some quirks in that he always used to hang on the traction on the end of my bed, which made the traction wiggle, which hurt my leg, but he just couldn't seem to remember that. And I was also blessed with a wonderful supportive family and even my pastor from my church who came and visited me every single day for the three and a half months that I was in the hospital, which was a real blessing. So uh, the compassion story that Wanda asked me to share again this past um, Sunday when I came in to speak to the nurses uh, goes like this. Um, about two and a half months into my uh, hospitalization, I really just wanted to go outside. I was in there for basically the whole summer. And so I asked my doctor, Dr. Pittman, if I could possibly go outside even just for a few minutes. And he said, there's no way that leg is going outside of this hospital because I still had an open wound. So I was basically, he left and I, I was crying and the nurse came into the room and asked, why are you crying? And, um, and I said, my, my doctor just won't let me go outside even just for a minute. And, I, and the nurse then says, tell me exactly what the doctor said. And he says, there's no way that leg is going outside of this hospital. So she went, hmm, okay. And then she came back a few minutes later with another nurse and a stretcher and actually wheeled me down the hall to uh, an emergency exit. Uh, which were there, they were somehow able to open without setting off an alarm. They actually slid me out the door uh, on this stretcher all the way out so that my waist was basically at the door frame uh, so that my, out, my top of my body was outside the hospital enjoying the fresh, clean air, whereas they did obey the doctor's order that my leg indeed did not leave the hospital. And I'll never forget that act of compassion uh, where the nurses went the extra mile for me. So that really created a vision for me to... Uh, to go and do likewise and to serve and uh, I actually applied some tinkering uh, and some engineering to help redesign the external fixer on my leg which was too weak using parallelograms and used some triangles to help create a, a stiffer better frame that actually allowed the leg to heal and I really appreciated my doctor allowing me to help 
with that, and that kind of inspired me to combine engineering with medicine, which led to me to go into medical school and then residency, and that's where I uh, learned about scoliosis surgery, where we were putting frames on the inside to help kids and adults uh, who were badly crooked to have a new life. Uh, then I served at uh, Duke Raleigh uh, after serving for 10 years at Big Duke on faculty, and then over the last uh, 11 years, I've been serving here at WakeMed for my pediatric patients. So just a little background on adolescent and pediatric scoliosis care, some information treatment and recovery. Um, with that background, the key objectives here are just to identify the different types of scoliosis, discuss the treatment options, look into depth into the scoliosis surgery, discuss the expectations, uh, and then go over how adolescents differ from adults and go over some of the diagnoses, including kyphosis, spondylolisthesis, and then, as we did for the talk, actually ask, uh, answer some questions. So what is scoliosis? It's a lateral curvature of the spine, either an S-shape or C-shape. It could be due to congenital, genetic, or other reasons, neuro neurologic, including cerebral palsy. Um, it, it's basically, we diagnose it by getting a Cobb angle um, greater than 10 degrees, and it can affect the bones, muscles, tendons, and ligaments in the spine. So um, this can be a lifelong problem. We'd like to catch it early in life, so we can possibly treat it with a brace. Um, but the bottom line is the spine is a complex column of over 17 different levels where each of those joints with the disc and the facet joints can um, basically have angular changes that can lead to a buckling effect. And this, even after kids are done growing, can lead to asymmetric loading that leads to asymmetric degeneration and then asymmetric deformity that can actually progress throughout life and cause major quality of life and other even breathing problems later in life. It's a basically a vicious cycle that we want to avoid. So um, the biomechanics of this has to do with our, the way the cartilage works in that even uh, in patients where we're, they're done growing and we think that everything is stable, well, no, 68% of them will actually continue to progress uh, during adulthood, which is why we want to track them carefully while they're growing, but actually keep an eye on, on these uh, scoliosis patients throughout their life. And this is just a good example of that on the far left. Uh, there's an example of a, a, an MRI study that was done looking at the disc changes in, in adolescent scoliosis patients, showing even during adolescence the discs can actually start to dehydrate and become damaged. However, if you, uh, in this particular study where they did scoliosis surgery on these uh, kids the, and re-MRI'd uh, them, we actually saw improvement in the uh, rehydration of the disc. So some of that damage could actually be reversed with realignment. And what we want to avoid is what's on the right-hand side here. We have a 53-year-old gentleman whose thoracic curve progressed, and which was a structural curve, but then his whole lumbar spine buckled, and there's basically bone on bone, and he's having a difficult time working on the riverboat in Mississippi as a result, a problem that could have been avoided if treated earlier. And that also creates major posture and self-image uh, issues for many patients, and in some severe cases, can even cause potential decreased pulmonary function. Idiopathic scoliosis really means we don't really know what the cause is, that it generally occurs during adolescence and uh, mostly during the adolescent growth spurt. About 30% of people uh, have a family member with scoliosis. If boys have scoliosis, they're much more likely to pass it on to girls, but girls are nine times more likely to have it than boys, and there really is no known cause. Con congenital scoliosis is when it actually occurs from birth and typically is segmental uh, defects where there's uh, bridging bone, uh, which can cause growth abnormalities uh, that can be pretty severe or in some cases are not too bad, um, but basically it's due to... Uh, actual segmental problems where vertebras are actually stuck together or there's vertebras that are, instead of being like a rectangle, are more like a triangle. Um, degenerative scoliosis is what can happen later in life. It could start off as an adolescent or degenerative or a uh, congenital scoliosis, but then with that wear and tear phenomenon over time, that can lead to progressive collapse uh, later in life that can become quite symptomatic and it can include things like spondylolisthesis or lateral slippage or forward slippage that can actually lead, lead, lead to nerve pinching. So what are our treatment options? Uh, we follow a lot of kids uh, and adults with scoliosis. Uh, they, they're often checked by their uh, pediatrician uh, with scoliometers, which is an, a, a tool that we use to measure the hump. And if it's over five or seven degrees, then uh, send them in to get evaluated with an x-ray and then follow-up exam. For certain curves that are between 25 to 40 degrees, we can actually treat growing children in a back brace as shown here with our cute little girl there with the red brace. 
Um, once the curve gets over 40 degrees, however, bracing is not really uh, very effective. Uh, and so it's during that window we will at least offer bracing, uh, but not force that on, on the kids and families, but discuss it in detail. Surgery is typically reserved for patients with curves over 40 degrees uh, or more. Um, and typically, uh, sometimes we do fix curves that are less than 40 if they're painful. So, so scoliosis surgery in depth, obviously under general anesthesia, the vertebra are exposed, spinous processes are removed, screws are placed at each of the levels. Uh, we then contour the rods to the proper shape. We might take out some bone wedges to help free it up uh, a little bit. Uh, we don't take bone graft from the iliac crest anymore, uh, but just use a local bone graft, an allograft bone graft. Uh, we then use multiple persuaders to then help correct the spine gently, derotating it, and then um, put the bone graft in and some mancomycin powder, and then close it up with a plastic surgery skin closure with four layers and then dermabond, stereostrips, gauze, and tegaderm on the skin. After surgery in the hospital, we advance up their activities of daily living, their diet, ensure that they have some flatus, do some good pain management. We tend not to use PCAs anymore, but just use oral medication and maybe some IV morphine. Uh, Post-op day zero, it's okay to get them up. Post-op day two, we control the pain and uh, get them up and around, advancing up their diet. By post-op day two, they should be increasing their ambulation ADLs with, with getting used to their new posture and pain control, and then always on the bowel regimen with, uh, uh, with the narcotics, which is Miralax and Senecot. And by day three, uh, if cleared by PTOT, typically by then they'll go home. Uh, some of our patients do come in from out of state, so sometimes we'll, we'll let them stay an extra day, uh, get ready to go home. Um, but uh, they typically go home on the oxycodone, uh, sometimes Oxycontin, uh, but uh, Robaxin, Naproxen, uh, Miralax, and the Senecot. Occasionally, uh, patients on the floor uh, might have a little bit of a bleeding area. We'd like to know about that. If it continues to bleed, we'll put a little uh, stitch in there with some uh, local um, uh, some local xylocaine. Um, so different techniques. This is uh, for small kids that are under the age of uh, 7 or 8. Uh, because of the amount of growth remaining, we'll typically do some sort of growing rod technology. This is an example of a Schiller technique where we do an anterior uh, fusion around the apex. This, this child had about 120 degree curve. And then uh, do a posterior uh, approach with a segmental fusion in the middle, but then with sliders. So you'll notice the rods are a bit long at the top and bottom. Those top screws can actually slide to allow for continued growth. And then uh, the child would come back for a final procedure uh, when their, uh, their, their chest has grown and their spine has grown more. Uh, there's a new technique that's just come out recently where we can do a similar thing using uh, magnetic rods uh, with a similar type of uh, outcome. So this is just an example of a, a mild scoliosis that was corrected uh, using instrumentation fusion. Uh, this is an example of a much more severe curve in a, a nine-year-old girl. You can see a multi-level instrumentation fusion, the dramatic improvement in her posture. Uh, the mom was just blown away by how nice her, her posture was, even on post-op day one when she's sitting up on the edge of the bed. Life-changing for her. And she's now doing very, very well uh, with her family. And, uh, and then we have the more extreme cases. This is Jonathan, who was, is kind of a celebrity at Wake Med. Uh, we did his surgery uh, last fall. Um, he was in the hospital. He had 130 degree curve, status post multiple surgeries, uh, had some difficulty breathing and difficulty uh, gaining weight. He actually was losing weight or just hanging even, not growing. So we admitted him for about six weeks ahead of time, skeletal traction, improved his nutrition with a feeding tube, and he actually gained a credible amount of weight, 14, 16 pounds over a few weeks. And his spine was twisted like a pretzel, rotated over about 90 degrees. And so he, we had him in traction all the time. This is a cart that uh, Jonathan's dad, Mike, and I built for him so he could walk around, even ride a skateboard down the hallway here at Wake Med. And uh, various people, including one of my scrub techs, came in, uh, Sheila, to spend time with them uh, doing arts and crafts uh, there at the hospital at Wake Med, which was, became a second home. And his, his spine gradually was stretched out using the traction, and we were able to do our definitive surgery. And this basically transformed the way he looked uh, over, over time, as his dad, Mike, documented. After surgery at home, generally there's no PTOT needed. They just walk. Um, in adults, uh, we've seen some hardware breakage due to physical therapy. That's not an issue for the kids. Our kids have no restrictions. We allow them to go back to sporting activities as soon as they feel able, and they generally turn to school in about two to three weeks. The gauze and tegaderm comes off post-op day three, usually when they get home, and then the steri strips come off at two weeks post-op unless they fall off uh, before that on their own. The dermabond is waterproof, so they can actually shower and get it wet, but we do not recommend going to a swimming pool or a hot tub for two weeks until after that skin is healed. 
after surgery, uh, the first year and for a lifetime. Basically, we, do, we see them back at six weeks, six months, or a year. For some of our patients uh, that come in from out of state, we just get them x-rays done locally, and they get sent in to us, and we just talk on the phone or go and visit them um, separately. And adults uh, occasionally require revision surgery above or below the fusion, which is why we like to catch them earlier to, before they have that disc degeneration. And uh, women can get pregnant later on and have epidurals below the hardware. They just need to know where the bottom of the fusion is. And generally, the flexibility is well-maintained, and growth typically is not stunted. They actually have a big growth spurt on the day of their surgery, especially with kyphosis patients who will grow uh, several inches, four or five inches possibly on the severe deformities. Our adolescents go back to participating in sports and activities as soon as they feel ready. Uh, adults have some more restrictions. So there's lots of difference between adolescents and adults. The, the adults heal more slowly, they have more degenerative uh, things and could have nerve pinching that we have to deal with as well, and obviously more medical uh, problems. And this is just an example of how the treatment could be different, where the adults sometimes wait too long and they end up needing this longer fusion down to the pelvis, whereas if we catch it early, we can restore that disc alignment for those lower spines like we showed in that MRI study, and hopefully then be able to preserve those discs for a lifetime. So other things that are different in terms of the post-op restrictions is that the adults have more restrictions on them afterwards, whereas the kids basically we let them go. Uh, so kyphosis is a forward bend of the spine. Uh, there's different types, Schoerman's kyphosis, just postural. We typically uh, don't worry about it uh, unless it gets significantly bigger than the normal, which is 30 to 45 degrees. It can become painful over 60 degrees, and we start thinking about surgery more in the 70, 80 plus degree range. Um, here's just an example of a, a Schoerman's kyphosis pre-op and post-op and uh, with a good correction of the deformity and good pain relief. This is just an example of a, a teenage girl in the top right who had a pretty dramatic kyphosis, very poor quality of life with pain and also poor self-esteem. And post-op, it was like she had a personality transplant, uh, became much more uh, self-confident, was able to get through high school uh, with much greater uh, um, confidence and uh, with much better posture. In the bottom, there's a picture of a 50-year-old lady I saw from uh, from Chicago who actually had a 90-degree kyphosis, felt like she looked like a turtle throughout her life, but also developed severe neck pain, had about had four normal cervical MRIs done, uh, and had a, about this 90-degree kyphosis and also some lower back pain. And that neck pain was relieved by fixing her kyphosis since her neck had to go into hyperextension uh, due to the severe thoracic deformity. So spondylolisthesis is a forward slip of the spine. Often it starts off with a pars fracture, um, which can cause back pain and it can cause a nerve pinch if the vertebral body slips forward. Um, this is just a severe case of that had surgery done elsewhere and had a forward slip where it was almost slipped off the front. It had a very severe flat back posture, which we were able to correct and pull back into position and to correct that deformity. He's now doing very, very well. Um, patients tend to do very well long term if we catch them early. This is just a picture of a, a patient that I uh, took care of about 11 years ago. And her picture is on the wall there when she was a freshman in high school after her thoracolumbar scoliosis was fixed. And she actually returned to uh, um, school actually within a week or so and actually returned to cheerleading practice around the same time. And basically now is 10 years out, still very active, excellent posture, and no, no significant back pain. Um, sometimes we do take care of older patients. This is a patient who was in her 40s who had a pretty severe uh, right thoracic curve over 55 degrees with progressive pain. And she had surgery in her 40s. And uh, Marshall Del Barone, who's here from Raleigh, who wrote a book called Curved Inspirations about her whole experience and how it's really uh, greatly affected her self-confidence and her pain relief and quality of life. Uh, this is a 24-year-old uh, lady who had, was born with one lung, who had a progressive 85-degree scoliosis compressing on her existing lung and severe pain. Uh, she, I fixed her after referral from a Duke uh, orthopedic doc, spine doc who sent her to me, and she now is, uh, has excellent pain relief, is able to play with her 4-year-old and return to full family life, uh, very thankful, and with a, a good hope for the future for good pulmonary function. Uh, this is an example of a 43-year-old uh, who had a thoracolumbar scoliosis with progressive back and radiating leg pain and poor quality of life. She's a triathlete and physical therapist. Her husband's also a therapist, physical therapist from Houston. And so we did a, a six-level fusion for her, got her realigned, and then she was able to gradually recover over this last year to the point where seven months post-op, she actually competed in the Houston Marathon, ran 26 miles with no significant back pain, no leg pain, and a pretty, pretty amazing time of three hours and 35 minutes, really with a restored quality of life. But we like to catch these patients earlier during adolescence, 
uh, because that can actually prevent some of the degeneration that occurs later. Uh, but adults sometimes can be helped as well. So in conclusion, the bottom line is, is that uh, we're always available. Rachel and I are available for questions uh, at Hay Clinic. Uh, our mobile numbers are listed here that you can always reach us. Uh, we really appreciate partnering with you uh, to help care for patients with my own uh, history. Uh, it's really nurses, physical therapists, and doctors working together that transformed my own life and motivated me uh, to want to uh, administer compassion uh, to, to kids like Jonathan and adults as well uh, to really help transform their life uh, for the better and hopefully inspire another generation to do the same. So thank you for being part of our winning team here at uh, WakeMed. If we can be of any service uh, to you, please do not hesitate to call. And thanks for all you do every way to create miracles uh, like Jonathan and his family. And uh, I look forward to uh, working with you guys uh, in the future. Thanks.